Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is motor drives. Our objective is to introduce a power electronics device known as a motor drive that varies the magnitude and frequency of applied voltage to vary the resultant torque and speed of a motor under its direction. We'll summarize the internal operation of a motor drive and examine specifications, features, and basic parameters of motor drives. The structure operates under the assumption you are familiar with the operating principle of three-phase AC motors. For those necessitating a review of this topic, you are encouraged to revisit the rotating magnetic field lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. Additionally, it is presumed the viewer has a general understanding of AC circuit analysis. It should be noted that this introductory lecture does not dive into manufacturer idiosyncrasies or operation procedures for specific motor drives and will largely summarize the inner workings of motor drives. Later lectures will examine applications of specific motor drives as well as discuss in detail those power electronics devices internal to a motor drive that make this possible. Expectations having been properly directed, let us continue. As you are no doubt aware, the synchronous speed, the speed of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator of a three-phase AC motor, is a function of the number of pole pairs per phase and excitation frequency of the applied voltage. The formula I use to determine the synchronous speed is 60 times the applied frequency divided by the number of pole pairs per phase. Specifically note the term I'm using in this formula, pole pairs per phase. This means a three-phase AC motor with 12 poles has four poles per phase and two pole pairs per phase. Using this formula, it should be readily apparent that when the number of pole pairs per phase is held constant, synchronous speed is directly proportional to frequency. As frequency increases, synchronous speed increases. Conversely, as frequency decreases, synchronous speed decreases. As an example of frequency's direct influence on synchronous speed, consider a three-phase AC motor with two pole pairs per phase operated at 50 Hz. This motor would experience a synchronous speed of 1500 RPM. If excitation frequency increased to 60 Hz, the synchronous speed would proportionally increase to 1800 RPM. Similarly, it should be well within your capacity to understand that when excitation frequency is held constant, synchronous speed is inversely proportional to the number of pole pairs per phase. As the number of pole pairs per phase increases, synchronous speed decreases. Conversely, as the number of pole pairs per phase decreases, synchronous speed increases. As an example of the number of pole pairs per phase inverse influence on synchronous speed, consider a three-phase AC motor with two pole pairs per phase operated at 60 Hz. As previously, this motor would experience a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM. If excitation frequency remained at 60 Hz, however, if the motor employed three pole pairs per phase, the motor would experience a slower synchronous speed of 1200 RPM. Given most distribution systems operate at fixed frequency, 60 Hz being the US standard and 50 Hz being the EU standard, this leads to quantum levels of synchronous speed. In the US, it is common to experience motors with a synchronous speed of 3600, 1800, 1200, 900, 720 RPM, and so on. All these speeds being a result of the number of pole pairs per phase since frequency is fixed. In the EU, one would typically experience motors running at 3,000, 1,500, 1,000, 750, 600 RPM, and so on. It should be noted that increasing the number of pole pairs per phase increases the physical size of a similarly rated motor. For example, a 1.5 kilowatt motor with four pole pairs per phase might be twice as big and heavy as a 1.5 kilowatt motor with only two pole pairs per phase. To briefly examine this tangentially related topic, given mechanical power is the product of the twisting force known as torque and rotational speed divided by 9.55, it can be shown that the similarly rated larger motor turns slower but exerts more torque because of the increased number of pole pairs per phase. Assuming the motors are operated at 60 Hz, the one with two pole pairs per phase rotates at 1800 RPM and the one with four pole pairs per phase rotates at 900 RPM. Rearranging the mechanical power formula suggests torque equals 9.55 times mechanical power divided by rotational speed. Substituting in the given values, we find the one with two pole pairs per phase exerts roughly 8 newton meters of torque, 
and the one with four pole pairs per phase exerts roughly 16 newton meters of torque. For those wishing to review mechanical power as it relates to electric motors, I direct your attention to the Mechanical Power, Torque and Rotational Speed Lecture available at the Big Bad Tech Channel. Returning to the topic at hand, note the synchronous speed is the speed of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator and not the actual speed of the rotor. This may take some explanation. Two notable classes of three-phase AC motors exist, synchronous and induction machines. The rotor of a three-phase AC synchronous motor, as the name implies, is synchronized with that of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator when inside its operational range. The rotor speed of a synchronous motor is therefore equal to the synchronous speed inside its operational range. Synchronous motors can be of the permanent magnet or electrically excited variety. The rotor of a three-phase AC induction motor, in contrast, must necessarily lag behind the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator for the induction process to work at all. The rotor speed of an induction motor therefore has a more complex relationship with synchronous speed and must take into account applied load. The speed torque curve of a generic induction motor shows that even at no load conditions, the rotor speed is slightly less than the synchronous speed and when operated at rated load conditions, even less. Though the full range of an induction motor includes all possibilities of rotational speed down to zero RPM, they customarily only operated inside a small window where speed and torque play nice and linear. Induction motors can be of the squirrel cage or wound rotor variety. Long story short, while synchronous speed remains quantized at specific levels, notably 3600, 1800, 1200 RPM and so on, actual rotor speed for induction motors range around these fixed values. Consider a three-phase AC squirrel cage induction motor with two pole pairs per phase operated at 60 Hz. The synchronous speed might be 1800 RPM, but even in no load conditions, the rotor might rotate at only 1790 RPM. When experiencing rated load, the rotor speed might drop to 1670 RPM. When exerting maximum torque, the rotor speed may drop all the way to 1100 RPM. However, if it remained here for any length of time, the motor would quickly enter overload conditions. Assuming we operate the induction motor using a fixed excitation frequency within its intended range, this still results in specific quantized levels of speed. The only wiggle room with respect to speed you've really got is the choice of motors, which if you think about it, does provide a primitive means of speed control. Assuming 60 Hz, if an application necessitated a nominal speed of 3600 RPM, one chooses a motor with one pole pair per phase. If, however, the application necessitates a nominal input of 1800 RPM, one chooses a motor with two pole pairs per phase, and so on. For applications necessitating two distinct speeds, a clunky old school method of speed control made use of separate winding motors. Separate winding motors basically consisted of stators with several pole pairs per phase that could be connected or disconnected as needed to change the resultant synchronous speed given a fixed excitation frequency. When the motor needed to run at high speed, the separate winding motor was connected such that it ran using less pole pairs per phase such that synchronous speed was higher. When the motor needed to run at low speed, the separate winding motor was connected such that it ran using more pole pairs per phase such that synchronous speed was lower. This made separate winding motors more expensive, mechanically complex, and a little bit larger than necessary, but did result in two distinct speed ranges, although still exhibiting a large no man's land between the two ranges. The obvious problems are those scenarios necessitating a nominal input speed of something other than the readily available 3600, 1800, 1200 RPM, and so on. A convenient solution to these scenarios are mechanical step-up or step-down gearboxes or belt and pulley combinations with a gear or pulley ratio such that input and output rotational speed are appropriately exchanged for torque. For example, consider an application necessitating a nominal input of 2000 RPM, a rotational speed figure ordinarily stranded in the large no man's land between single pole pair per phase and two pole pair per phase three phase AC induction motors. Assuming 60 Hz, one could purchase a three-phase AC motor with a single pole pair per phase with a synchronous speed of 3600 RPM and a 1.8 to 1 step-down gearbox 
to arrive at the nominal 2000 RPM output. Similarly, one could purchase a three-phase AC induction motor with two pole pairs per phase with a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM and a 1 to 1.11 step up gearbox to arrive at the nominal 2000 RPM. Either combination results in the desired nominal rotational speed of 2000 RPM. It should be noted that most fixed speed machines making use of gearboxes actually step motor speed down more than these simple examples suggest. Additionally, it should be noted that the gearbox exchanges speed for torque. As speed goes down, torque goes up, and vice versa. Regardless, given the right ratios, through mechanical modification of pre-existing speed levels, we've now effectively thrown wide open the doors to a theoretically infinite range of speeds. This being said, given a fixed excitation frequency, a fixed number of pole pairs per phase, and a fixed gear ratio, output speed is still fixed. While suitable for some applications, this isn't always the best means of control for others. Consider a pumping or air handling application in which infinitely variable flow rates are required. Given flow rate, a measure of volume per unit time is a product of volumetric displacement per revolution times revolution per unit time, a pump with a fixed displacement value operated at a fixed speed will always produce a constant flow rate. Long story short, flow rate is a direct reflection of rotational speed. A separate winding motor might be able to produce two distinct flow rates, however what we really want is infinitely precise tuning depending upon conditions. Old school flow control methods for hopelessly outdated systems, believe it or not, ran a motor at full speed all the time and simply tightened down a damper or diverted flow elsewhere if less than full flow was required. Talk about wasted energy. This would be equivalent to driving to class with a gas pedal on the floor at all times and modulating your speed around every turn stoplight or school zone with regular and constant applications of the brake. In both scenarios, an ample amount of energy is constantly being converted, only to be wasted when less input is required. A far better scenario for those applications necessitating a range of speed values is to think from the bottom up. Long story short, rather than constantly hammering on the gas and intermittently applying the brakes, let off the gas when you want to slow down and step on it when you want to speed up. What is required for applications necessitating variable speed is quite obviously a variable speed motor. Various methods of speed control exist. Some of the earliest variable speed motors were DC motors and are still in use today because DC motors have a linear speed to applied voltage relationship and can develop large torque even at extremely low speeds. We'll examine various configurations of DC motors in later lectures. Another type of variable speed motor is a wound rotor induction motor where rotor resistance is varied, thus affecting the induction process and the resultant speed of the rotor. While effective, this method is notoriously inefficient and does not develop large torque at low speeds like a DC motor. All these methods, while effective, are being largely supplanted by the advent of inexpensive and extremely versatile motor drives. Motor drives are known by many names. Pretty much pick one of these words, variable or adjustable. One of these words, frequency or speed, and one of these words, drive or converter, and then string them together in any order you want, and you've got something I'm calling a motor drive. Acceptable combinations include variable frequency drive, adjustable speed drive, or their numerous interchangeable abbreviations. VFDs, AFDs, VSDs, or ASDs. Regardless of the terminology employed, all of these devices are solid state power electronics devices that, as some of the titles imply, vary or adjust the magnitude and frequency of applied voltage to a motor under its direction. Returning our attention to those qualities that affect synchronous speed, notably frequency and number of pole pairs per phase, you can see the clear advantage of a motor operated with a motor drive. Given frequency is no longer fixed, but rather a continuously variable quantity, the synchronous speed can now be continuously varied for a mechanically simple motor with a fixed number of pole pairs per phase. As an example of frequency's direct influence on synchronous speed, consider a three-phase AC induction motor with two pole pairs per phase operated at 60 Hz. Ordinarily, this motor would experience a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM. If, however, a motor drive supplied a reduced excitation frequency of 40 Hz, the synchronous speed would proportionally decrease to 1200 RPM. 
Similarly, if a motor drive supplied an increased excitation frequency of 100 Hz, the same motor would experience a proportionally increased synchronous speed of 3000 RPM. Assuming a 100 Hz maximum output, this motor is now theoretically operable inside a 0 to 3000 RPM range with no quantum jumps between fixed speed levels. But wait, that's not all. In addition to this wondrous quality of finely variable speed control, motor drives offer numerous other features as well, including, but not limited to, soft starts, soft stops, customizable acceleration and deceleration profiles, accessory digital and analog inputs and outputs, allowing remote operation and communication, braking, advanced protection mechanisms, fault display and recording, and the capability of sophisticated closed loop control. In fact, a full list of motor drive capabilities would not only be tedious, but pointless, since numerous manufacturers offer numerous different models, all with their own hopelessly confusing and non-transferable methods of navigating this thick forest of options. This being said, we'll briefly discuss some general motor drive features and specifications. Before expounding upon the virtues of motor drives, it's worth investigating the magic that occurs inside the magic box known as a motor drive, at least on a general level. Later lectures in power electronics will examine this process in nauseating detail. For our purposes, we can satisfy ourselves with a general overview. If we were to picture the motor drive as a magic box, three phase AC with fixed magnitude and frequency comes in, and three phase AC with a different magnitude and frequency comes out based on a motor drive settings established by the user. At this level of sophistication, a motor drive is therefore a power electronics device known as an AC to AC converter. Internal to this magic box, this process can be visualized as two other power electronics device. One, a rectifier that converts incoming three phase AC with fixed magnitude and frequency into DC. Another, an inverter that converts DC into an outgoing three-phase AC with adjustable magnitude and frequency. When viewed at this increased level of detail, a motor drive is a rectifier, an AC to DC converter, followed by an inverter, a DC to AC converter. For this reason, motor drives are somewhat mistakenly referred to as inverters, which actually only describes one half of their purpose. The DC voltage in between the two related power electronic stages is sometimes known as the DC bus or the DC link. The DC bus can store tremendously large values of DC voltage and must be treated with caution. For example, a motor drive operated on 120 volt line to neutral and 208 volt line to line light industrial three phase AC might have an average DC bus value of over 280 volts. Additionally, energy storage devices like capacitors inside the motor drive can store a lethal charge even after being powered off. For this reason, most motor drives include safety and protection mechanisms that are designed to automatically dump the DC bus within a specified amount of time after being powered off. Take the necessary precautions and follow all manufacturer's recommended lockout and tagout procedures. Test and verify the DC bus in the motor drive is discharged prior to working on or around it. Delving deeper into the inner workings of a motor drive, without bottoming out in an unnecessarily technical discussion, we find several additional functional elements. Both the rectifier and inverter portions include filtration circuits to clean up the respective outputs. The rectifier, as previously discussed, is an AC to DC converter that changes the incoming three-phase AC with a fixed magnitude and frequency into DC. Ordinarily, the rectifier is a type of three-phase AC bridge rectifier that produces an output with an inherent ripple. This ripple is removed with a filtration circuit that produces a relatively stable DC value. As mentioned previously, the part of the filtration circuit may include energy storage devices like capacitors that can store a lethal charge if not properly dissipated. We'll examine diodes, thyristors, natural commutation, and three-phase bridge rectifiers that make rectification possible in later lectures. The other half of the motor drive, the inverter, can also be modeled as having two distinct stages one being the inverter itself, being the part that changes the incoming DC into three-phase AC with a variable magnitude and frequency, the other being filtration circuit that cleans up this stage's respective output. The inverter, in summary, can be viewed as a collection of high-speed, solid-state switches that selectively connect or disconnect the DC link for various amounts of time and with a given polarity, the result being a type of pulsed output. 
when the filtration circuit smooths out the pulsed output, we are left with something mimicking three-phase AC, only this time, frequency and magnitude are variable. This type of inversion process is known as pulse width modulation, sometimes commonly referred to using its abbreviation, PWM. Pulse width modulated inversion takes some explanation to understand the process in its entirety. I originally intended to summarize this process in this lecture, however, even the summary is a little lengthy. Let's hold this topic off for another lecture. For now, put your hand on top of the internet and repeat after me. I, state your name, believe. I believe a motor drive accepts incoming three-phase AC with a fixed magnitude and frequency, rectifies it all to DC, then outputs three-phase AC with a variable magnitude and frequency. Like I said, we'll explore this faith-based mystery in a later lecture. However, realize this rectification and subsequent inversion process is not without its limits, because very often the output of a motor drive is electrically noisy, sometimes characterized by high voltage spikes at the output, even after filtration. Related to this electrical noise phenomenon, it should be noted that a motor paired with a motor drive must be inverter rated. An inverter rated motor has several design considerations, such that performance and longevity of the motor are optimized. First, an inverter rated motor must remain cool even when operated at low speeds, and may include enhanced heat dissipation surfaces, or even a separate blower. Additionally, inverter rated motors also include upgraded insulation and incorporate additional design elements to withstand any high voltage spikes. Let's put aside the inner workings of a motor drive for now and examine general characteristics of motor drives. This might seem overwhelming at first since some of it comes with associated baggage that may or may not be in your possession at this time. Not to worry though, since I plan on discussing some of these characteristics in greater detail in later supporting lectures. For now, let's consider this a general inventory, and if something is pertinent to our discussion right now, we'll pick it up and examine it, and if not, we'll check it back in the pile and pick it up later. Let's do this inventory in small chunks so we're not overwhelmed. Motor drives are specified using several different characteristics, notably rated input voltage and current, rated output voltage and current, acceptable power rating of the motor under direction, and apparent power output of the device. Input voltage is that supply voltage necessary to operate the motor drive, ordinarily including acceptable minimums and maximums, typically expressed as plus or minus an acceptable percentage. Most motor drive manufacturers divide their offerings into three general product classes, three-phase 200 volt class devices, including three-phase AC distribution systems with nominal 200 to 240 volt values, three-phase 400 volt class devices, including three-phase AC distribution systems with nominal 380 to 480 volt values, and single-phase devices. By the way, these are arbitrary distinctions. Certain manufacturers may divide this into more or less classes and offer motor drives that operate using higher voltages. One of these input classes may jump out to you as an oddity, that of motor drives with single phase AC input. But yes, it's true, there exist motor drives that make use of single phase AC input. Returning to our earlier summary of the internal workings of a motor drive, recall that a motor drive can be thought of as two back-to-back -back power electronics devices, a rectifier, being an AC to DC converter, and an inverter, a DC to AC converter, with a DC link in between. The point being that the inverter portion of the motor drive largely does not care how the DC got there in the first place. All it needs is a grocery bag full of DC to whip up three-phase AC output with an adjustable frequency of magnitude. Motor drives intended to operate using single-phase AC simply use a single-phase AC to DC rectifier in the front end rather than a three-phase AC to DC rectifier as for those devices intended to operate using three-phase AC. Both these devices use the same DC to three phase AC inverter on the back end. Additionally, there exist flexible motor drives that can make use of both three phase AC and single phase AC depending upon mode. This feature is extremely cool, especially for light industrial users and small business owners without ready access to industrial three phase AC. At business startup, one can just run the motor drive off commonly available single phase AC. At a later date, when you're a legitimate player and have made enough money to install proper three-phase AC, you can simply toggle the operational mode of the same motor drive and continue operations as previously. Input current specifications relate the current draw when the motor drive is operating the motor under its direction at rated conditions. Keep in mind, rated conditions is a snapshot of a single point on a motor's operational curve. If the motor is experiencing less than rated conditions, current draw will be less. If the motor is experiencing more than rated conditions, current draw will be more. 
greater than rated conditions is an overload and if sustained for any length of time might damage the motor. Luckily, motor drives often include sophisticated overload detection and protection mechanisms we'll examine later. Output voltage and current specifications are just the opposite, being the voltage and current output of the drive. Given motor drives are capable of varying frequency and magnitude, this entry in a motor drive datasheet may specify maximum magnitude and frequency. A typical small general purpose motor drive might be adjustable up to 100 Hz. However, there exist special purpose motor drives for exotic applications like centrifuges used to enrich uranium that can output at frequencies of 600 Hz or higher. For obvious reasons, these are export control devices and not something you pick up from your local electrical supply shop. Those of you familiar with the history behind the Stuxnet cyber attacks in 2009-2010-ish will note that Stuxnet specifically targeted motor drives capable of this feat. But that, as they say, is another story entirely. Power ratings for motor drives are typically specified using two entries, one being the rated output mechanical power of the motor that is intended to be controlled, and two, the apparent power output of the drive itself. An example might be a 400 watt motor drive capable of producing 1 kVA of apparent power. This entry means that the drive is intended to operate a motor capable of producing 400 watts of mechanical power output. However, the motor drive is capable of producing 1 kVA or 1000 volt amperes of apparent power, which if you recall is the vector summation of real and reactive power. At risk of opening up a barrel of rage-infected monkeys concerning apparent power, consider a motor that produces 400 watts of usable mechanical power, yet consumes 500 watts of real power, and let's say 400 volt amperes reactive of reactive power. This corresponds to an apparent power consumption of approximately 640.3 volt amperes and is inside the range of the specified motor drive. When we look at this using a chained system efficiency perspective, Note that the motor is squandering 100 watts of available real power due to inefficiencies. The motor would therefore have an efficiency rating of 400 out over 500 watts in, or 80%. Additionally, note the motor drive itself may be squandering some input. Let's say to produce the necessary 640.3 volt ampere output, the motor drive itself might necessitate consumption of 710.6 volt amperes comprised of 550 watts of real power and 450 volt amperes of reactive power. This means that the motor drive itself is wasting 50 watts of incoming real power due to inefficiencies. The motor drive would therefore have an efficiency rating of 500 watts out or 550 watts in, or 90.9%. This is to say nothing about power factor nor power factor correction, which as they say, is yet another barrel of rage infected bunkies I wish not to open at this time. More to the point of this lecture, a motor drive manufacturer may specify efficiency rating of the drive, in this case 90.9%. Additionally, motor drives are generally specified using dimensions, enclosure specifications, and acceptable environmental conditions. Another general means of classifying motor drives is the control method employed. Motor drives are ordinarily classified as volts per hertz drives or flux vector drives. Flux vector drives can be further subdivided into sensorless or closed loop vector drives. This is a topic I am purposely tiptoeing around in the interest of expediency. We'll examine the details about these control methods in later lectures, but for now, the short summary will have to suffice. Volts per hertz drives vary the magnitude of the output voltage. Sensorless flux vector drives can also vary the magnitude of the output voltage in addition to monitoring the phase angle between voltage and current. Closed loop vector drives can do everything a sensorless vector drive can do, but are also intended to operate with an encoder feedback device that monitors a motor's actual position and speed in real time. Like I said earlier, let's gently put this topic back in the pile and back away slowly until we've got some free time to punch this tar baby to death. Moving on, motor drives may also be specified with respect to certain functional and control specifications like soft starts, acceleration and deceleration times and patterns, overload current rating, instantaneous overcurrent protection, carrier or switching frequency adjustment at range, and starting torque. Motor drives may also be specified with respect to protection functions like overcurrent, overvoltage, undervoltage events, thermal errors, overload limits, memory errors, communication errors, overvoltage suppression during deceleration, momentary power outage write out, disconnection and bypass means, and emergency cutoffs. 
Motor drives may also include handy bonus features or options like jogging operation, PID control, torque boost functions, fault monitoring, whether or not the drive includes a regenerative braking unit or braking resistor, whether or not the drive is capable of performing DC injection braking, and whether or not the drive includes accessory input and output filters to reduce noise or line and load reactors to suppress harmonics. Motor drives may also sport optimized design features for specific applications, including but not limited to constant torque applications, variable torque applications, shock or impact loads, constant speed applications, or super high speed applications like production of enriched uranium using a centrifuge. Finally, motor drive specifications include details about means of communication, including the type of communication port, the drive programming method, diagnostic indicators and alarms, and the number of type of digital and analog inputs and outputs. Allow me to briefly comment on drive programming and communication configuration before we bring this lecture to a close. Sorry this lecture is getting a little long, but I feel a proper introduction to motor drives should encompass this base material. I promise later lectures on motor drives will encompass less material, but do so in a more, shall we say, intense fashion. Stay sharp and be sure to warm up and stretch beforehand. Anyways, programming a motor drive is essentially the means a technician walks through all those parameters we previously discussed and sets it up so the motor drive does what it's supposed to do. Drive programming can be a complex and tedious affair because very often the actual process requires intimate knowledge of a specific motor drive's decision tree and navigation within it using an extremely limited number of buttons and the extremely small display panel available on the operator's interface. To anyone who has hacked their way through this thick, confusing jungle, believe me, I feel your pain. To ease this burden, some manufacturers offer offline programming software allowing a technician to use a regular PC and far easier means of navigation to program and even simulate operation of a motor drive. Once the program is complete, it can then be downloaded to the motor drive and saved. A properly pre-configured motor drive consists of a number of user-adjustable parameters that vary from manufacturer to manufacturer and drive to drive. While a complete listing would both be tedious and pointless, I tend to break parameters into several broad categories notably motor data, basic functions, advanced functions, conditions necessitating protection against, those conditions that warrant errors, and those parameters that need to be displayed, recorded, or sent, and communication configuration. Up front, a motor drive needs to be told what type of motor it's driving, since motor drives ordinarily lack the motivation to pick up the phone and ask the motor out on a date and spend some time getting to know it. Often this step simply necessitates a technician read the intended motor's nameplate and input this data into the motor drive. Critical data often include in this preliminary meet and greet are the motor's rated mechanical power output, base frequency, typically 60 Hz in the US and 50 Hz in the EU, the number of pole pairs per phase, rated speed, full load current, supply voltage, and depending upon the specific drive and application, unloaded or magnetizing current, and DC state or resistance. The unloaded or magnetizing current is, as the name implies, the current drawn when the motor is free spinning without a load. The DC stator resistance value is often critical for those motor drives capable of DC injection braking. The bulk of the remaining steps in programming a motor drive are those application-specific settings that make motor drives so useful and versatile, as well as the upper and lower limits for protection and error detection. Long story short, it's setting up the remaining parameters of the motor drive. Examples of basic and advanced function parameters might include default rotation direction, preset speed, acceleration and deceleration time, acceptable minimum and maximum speeds, dynamic braking methods employed, carrier frequency, PID gain values, or any other wondrously complex operations sufficient to achieve the desired results. Examples of protection and error parameters might be overload limits, overcurrent suppression functions, instantaneous overcurrent values, overvoltage values, and so on. Examples of parameters that might need to be displayed, recorded, or sent somewhere might be the output frequency, the output voltage, the runtime, or other pertinent data that needs to be communicated with the outside world. The last programming parameter category, communication configuration, requires a bit of explaining as well as an accompanying diagram. 
a simplified block diagram of a generic motor drive intended to operate with three-phase AC might look something like this. The motor drive obviously has three-phase AC input terminals specified L1, L2, and L3, or sometimes R, S, and T, depending upon country of origin. Additionally, it has three-phase output terminals specified T1, T2, and T3, or sometimes U, V, and W, depending upon country of origin. Between the three-phase AC input, one might observe external disconnection means like a circuit breaker, as well as any accessory external input filters or line reactors. Between the three-phase AC output and the motor under its direction, one might observe any accessory external output filters or load reactors. Additionally, a motor drive necessitates an external power supply connection to power up the internal electronics that make the rectification, inversion, and control process possible. For those motor drives necessitating an external braking resistor, you might see braking resistor connections. Additionally, motor drives may include supplemental bypass contactors that I've not included in this diagram. If our purpose is to discuss direct operation of a pre-programmed motor drive at the point of use, we can kind of stop right here after we include a couple buttons and a dial along with a super, super tiny dimly lit display on the front. Note, some drives make use of an interface linked to it via a cable. We'll come back to expand this block diagram in a moment. To directly operate a motor drive, a technician uses the keypad interface to directly stop, start, change direction, adjust speed, and read parameters. If a motor drive has been properly pre-configured using the above summarized programming procedure, an untrained operator really only requires limited interaction with the device and does not need to familiarize themselves with the programming procedure nor navigating the decision tree. An operator wishing to start the pre-programmed motor drive simply presses the big green start button, and an operator wishing to stop the motor drive simply presses the big red stop button. If an operator wants the drive to go faster, they turn the dial one way. If an operator wants the drive to go slower, they turn the dial the other. Motor drives may also include password protection that prevent untrained operators, under the false assumption that they are trained operators, from haphazardly adjusting the desired parameters. Expanding upon this block diagram, motor drives also include accessory digital and analog inputs and outputs that allow the motor drive to remotely interact with a larger system without the necessity of constant and direct human supervision. Digital inputs and outputs are those that have two mutually exclusive states, either on or off, that can never be a little bit of both or halfway in between. Ordinarily, a motor drive includes several fixed function digital inputs and outputs, as well as one or more multifunction digital inputs and outputs that are customizable by the user and can assume many different roles depending upon the needs of the process. Let's say our simplified block representation of a generic motor drive includes two fixed function digital inputs, two multifunction digital inputs, two fixed function digital outputs, and two multifunction digital outputs. Those inputs and outputs specified as fixed function, as the name implies, perform that function only and are not customizable. Let's assume fixed function digital input one is permanently assigned the start input that starts the motor using the pre-programmed parameters. Let's assume fixed function digital output one is permanently assigned the run output. Anytime the motor drive is running, this digital output would be asserted. In contrast, those inputs and outputs specified as multifunction, as the name implies, are user customizable. For example, multifunction digital input three could be programmed to act as a momentary jogging input today, and then when the motor drive parameters are reprogrammed, act as an enable signal for PID control input tomorrow. With respect to multifunction digital outputs, multifunction digital output three could be programmed to act as a constant speed arrival signal today, and then when the motor drive parameters are reprogrammed, act as an overload warning tomorrow. Long story short, the number and range of functions capable of being assigned to the multifunction inputs and outputs are direct reflections of the utility and versatility of motor drives for numerous applications. Analog inputs and outputs, in contrast, are those signals that are continuously variant proportional representations of a quality and can take any value inside a predetermined range. An example of an analog input might be a continuously variant external potentiometer used as a frequency reference input. This is often called the speed pot. As an operator turns the external speed potentiometer adjustment knob, the analog input signal proportionally varies 
thereby giving an operator or system a degree of fine control in the motor drive's resultant frequency and thus motor speed. Note we're assuming the motor drive itself is capable of supplying a positive 10 volt power and common connection to the potentiometer, which may or may not be the case. This analog input signal need not come from an operator or adjustable device like a speed potentiometer, but could also be some automatically generated incoming analog signal or transducer output. An example might be an incoming analog signal from a PLC. An example of an analog output might be a proportional representation of the real-time output frequency. This is sometimes called the frequency monitor signal and is often used for feedback closed-loop control purposes. Note that analog signals could be voltage or current signals proportional to the represented quantities. In addition to digital and analog inputs and outputs, motor drives often include sophisticated communication ports allow not only programming, but also real-time control and monitoring of a motor drive's operation. Communication ports may make use of any number of open or manufacturer-specific protocols that may or may not be compatible with one another. Certain motor drive applications, in fact, do not make use of any of the accessory analog and digital inputs and outputs, but rather handle all incoming and outgoing communication control via the communication port. It should be noted that accessory inputs and outputs of communication ports allowed a motor drive to interface not only with traditional hardwired switches and indicators, but also PLCs, themselves a reprogrammable and fully customizable control system. The reprogrammable nature of both motor drives and PLCs make them extremely attractive options for advanced systems. All right, we have just got to set this lecture down for a landing because I'm just about a fuel and I'm certain that tiny tiny head of yours is just filled to the brim with knowledge and at risk of overflowing. Luckily, we have arrived at a convenient breaking point. Like I said earlier, much more about specific motor drive applications await. In conclusion, this lecture took a brief look at motor drives, a power electronics device that vary the speed and torque of a motor under its direction by varying the supplied voltage magnitude and frequency. We reviewed those properties that influence synchronous speed, examined antiquated methods of speed control, discuss rectification, inversion, and filtration. Additionally, we examine common motor drive specifications and parameter programming. And finally, we examine a general block diagram of a motor drive, including fixed and multipurpose analog and digital inputs and outputs. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.